Welcome to the Masters of Metrics podcast, helping you get more out of your digital marketing investment. This podcast is proudly hosted by Digivisor, a platform for people who want to grow their business by taking a data-driven approach. Now, here's your host, Emma LaRusso. Today, I'm joined by David Meerman Scott, author of the 2020 Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Phenocracy, entrepreneur, global marketing and business growth speaker and advisor to emerging companies like HubSpot, Mind and Expert File. We're in for a treat today. Thank you for joining me on Masters of Metric, David. It's great to have you. Hey, uh, Emma, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for having me on. David, you're well known around the world for introducing new thinking into established marketing, brand and business development disciplines, whether it's PR, marketing, which I saw kind of that was the early focus, advertising and as the new platforms have come in social media and and kind of the broader digital marketing. We're really keen to kind of unlock your thoughts about how do you turn fans into customers and customers into fans. But I'd love to start with what was your, unpack your marketing career and what led you to authorship? And how did you create this view that you're now able to kind of advocate and inspire others around? Well, it's really because I had an unfair advantage. And I'll tell you why. My first job when I got out of university a long time ago, 35 years ago, was on a bond trading desk on Wall Street. So I worked on a bond trading desk on Wall Street and I was terrible at it and I hated it. But oh my God, did I learn about how digital information was being used. This was 15 years or so before the web. I was learning these things, maybe more like 10 years I was learning these things. Even though I hated bond trading and I wasn't good at it, What I did love was the information that bond traders used. So that was my career for the first half of my career was I worked for companies like Dow Jones and Reuters and Thompson in the real-time news and information business. This was all pre-internet, pre-web. That's why I say I had an unfair advantage because in 1995, that's my line in the sand for when the internet, uh, so when the web started, because that's when Netscape went public. People were saying, oh my gosh, this is so weird. We can see digital information. It's not weird. It's been around for a long time. I've been using that stuff for ages. So I realized pretty quickly that I was seeing patterns in the universe that nobody else was seeing. Pattern in the universe I saw was that marketing on the web, and this was in the late 1990s, was not about advertising, which is what everybody else was doing, but marketing on the web was about creating content. So um, when I was sacked by Thomson Reuters for being too radical, that's when I decided to go out on my own 18 years ago to talk and speak and write about what's possible in the digital world and how it's not just taking what you know in the offline world and putting it onto digital to reimagining what's possible. What made them think you were too uh, risky and difficult? <laughs> what was the catalyst for leaving? I, I know. Well, you what, I mean, me. what I what I was saying, what I, what I was saying to them, to my bosses, was we should be creating content on the web to generate attention and serve as marketing. Why create a press release and just send it to the media? Why not create a press release and put it out on the web so the search engines find it and people can find it? Why not put our email newsletter on the web so anybody can search it? Why keep it as a closed user group only going out with email? This was way pre-social media, so there was no social media out there, but it was all about websites. And then soon blog blogging started. And I said, well, let's create a blog. Let's do that. They were so set in their ways that believe it or not, when I was working at Thomson Reuters in the division that I was working in, the largest expense outside of salaries in the marketing department was postage. (laughs) In other words, the largest expense was sending out direct mail. And I'm like, we're an electronic information company here. Why not use electronic information to market the business? Oh, no, no, we don't do that here. So um, I got I got pretty, um, I don't know what's the right word, forward about my thoughts on how marketing should be done in the new world. And they didn't want any part of that. So they gave me my walking papers, which was the best career move I ever made. I highly recommend getting fired to people if they want to make a change. <laughs> it really kicks you into the gear. So so that was in 2002. And I never looked back. And I've been on my own since then, happily unemployed for 18 years. 
<laughs> well employed doing the things you want right that are value to yeah. others so so what actually what has the last 18 years been like well at first i was doing consulting just talking and working with companies around the ideas that i pioneered but then in um, 2007 one of the books i wrote called the new rules of marketing and pr um, hit all the international bestseller lists just uh, last month or two months ago it was published in the new seventh edition so the original first edition came out in 2007 and every other year or so, I publish a new edition. That book's now sold 400,000 copies in English. It's in 29 other languages. Wow. And so I'm constantly looking for other ways that I'm seeing patterns in the universe that other people aren't seeing. And I've had a couple of those happen to me recently. About, I guess it was about 12 or 13 years ago, I was seeing patterns in the universe that marketing was going real time. Nobody was talking about marketing being real time time except for me at that point. Because again, remember, I started my career in a bond trading desk 35 years ago. So the whole bond trading world is real time. If there's an announcement by a government agency or the president of the United States says something or the finance minister of Australia says something, it moves the markets. It's all happening in real time. And nobody was thinking about marketing being real time. But what happened about 13 years ago was number one, Twitter started. And number two, Google changed their algorithm to um, instantly index pages and blog posts. And I don't know if you remember that, Emma, but that was a really, really big deal because more than 13 or so years ago, and I don't remember the exact date this happened, if I wrote a blog post, it would take a month to get indexed by Google. If uh, I changed a page on my website, it would take a month to get indexed by Google. And all of a sudden they figured out how to make those changes in real time. And that was enormous <laughs> um, for marketing, but nobody was talking about it. Twitter was enormous for marketing, but nobody was talking about it in the very early days. So I wrote a book that eventually became the real-time marketing and PR about these ideas. I also invented a concept called newsjacking, which is um, when you follow the news, and if there's a breaking news story in an area that you have, you have expertise in, that you create real-time content around that in the form of a blog post or a tweet with a hashtag or a video or, or whatever it might be. And what that does is it gets your ideas into the marketplace at the moment people are looking for those ideas or at the moment the members of the media are looking for people to quote as they're writing their stories. I called it newsjacking. That's now become an enormous thing and people are talking about newsjacking all the time. It's even been listed in the Oxford English Dictionary and it, my name against it. So kind of cool to pioneer something that um, you've given credit for in the Oxford English Dictionary. But, but it really all comes back to what I said earlier that I got an unfair advantage in this whole digital marketing thing by working with digital information way before other people did. We have some synergies there, David. I started in financial markets myself and in marketing. And so it was always right message to right person at the right time. But no one mm -hmm. thought about the real time as digital became more proficient. But it's still taking organizations a long time to understand how to act on that real time information. So I'm kind of curious as we keep talking today, because and we started our business around making sense of all this real time data and insight, but right. it's organizations' capability to, to do something with it that still has a long way, or it's an opportunity for those organizations. I think for so long, marketing has been an, a discipline that's been planned out. You know, you create your, your marketing calendar and you know that three weeks from today, you're going to write a press release about this topic and um, you're going to do an update for the, to the website on such and such and such, and such a date. Uh, you've got a, a trade show, you know, we're in COVID now, so we're not doing them, but you know, you had a trade show on the agenda uh, on your calendar for, you know, six months from now or a virtual event that you're putting on or, or next week you're hosting a webinar. Marketing had always been this sort of calendar based approach that you would create something. And what our world today presents itself with, and you and I, of course, both know this, but it seems like a lot of business owners and marketing people really, I think they understand it, but they don't live it, is that anything can change instantly. And somebody can say something about you or your company, or there can be a development in your industry, or COVID can happen, or whatever, whatever is happening to just toss everything out the window. And 
And that's real time. That's instant. That's right now. And that is what marketing has become. And so few organizations in my mind are really focused on that because they're spending so much time planning ahead and so much time working on what's going to come out next week or next month that they're not thinking about what's going on right this second, right this moment, right this instant, and how they can use that as a way to generate interest among their buyers rather than just dreaming up something for the future. One of, one of the things I like, and it's been a premise just even hearing you say about why don't we go direct, you know, is this respect you have for the customer, right? It's what they care about. It's not what you plan it's really so much based around and that's why that real-time insight is part of it for our listeners who haven't read phenocracy what kind of drove that book and the concept that kind of you know that you wrote around so again in this whole pattern in the universe thing um (laughs) i've had four or five times where i've seen the stars and the moon and the sun and everything align in such a way that like oh my god i'm the only world person in the world seeing this and i probably wasn't the only person in the world seeing it but i was certainly the only person who wrote those things down how marketing is on the web is about publishing content not about advertising probably other people thought of that but i'm the only one who write it wrote it down when i did and real-time marketing probably other people assumed in real time was happening in terms of marketing, but no one else wrote about it. But what I really have been thinking about over the last five years is that the whole online marketing thing has become polarizing and has become chaotic. And the whole web world that we live in has, for so many people, been a place for a long time that's been safe and comfortable, but no longer is such. You've got organizations doubling down, sending yet a another tweet, you know, connecting with you on LinkedIn and immediately trying to sell you something. You've got politicians, certainly the politicians in my country who are using online marketing in nefarious ways. You've got the social media um, companies themselves who are profiting on polarization. The way that I, I believe Facebook is evil. I sold all my Facebook stock. I do not like what they're doing. And the reason I believe that is because their algorithms are all tuned around polarization. They're tuned to make you see only people who they believe are like you. And so what that means in the political world is that you're only seeing the people who agree with your position. And I think that's fabulously dangerous to have 2 billion people on the planet using a tool that is tuned, the algorithms are tuned around polarization. All of these things are coming together in my mind as being digital chaos. And I, I strongly believe that the pendulum has swung way too far in the direction of superficial online communications at a time when we humans are so hungry for a true human connection. I then got to be thinking about that human connection. What, what are the things where we are truly connecting? And I kept thinking about this this idea of the things that I'm a fan of, whether it's a certain product or a certain company or an idea or a rock band or whatever it might be. The things that I'm a massive fan of, I love to surf. I'm not very good at it, but I love to surf. I've been to 804 live music shows in my life. I keep a spreadsheet. That's how important it is to me, although I haven't been to one since March, unfortunately. I've seen, I've been to 75 Grateful Dead concerts, a band that has never toured Australia, sadly for you. Um, uh, 70, <laughs> 75 of one band is kind of ridiculous, but I'm a massive fan of the Grateful Dead. And so these ideas of, number one, the digital world has become polarizing in a cold, dark place, And number two, the warm, fuzzy, fun place are the things that I love. I then started to just dig into that and research that and spoke with neuroscientists to understand what's going on in our brain around this idea of fandom just dug into what I now call a fanocracy, which is the title of the book that came out earlier this year, really thinking about it from the perspective of the more that businesses can develop fans, the more successful that they'll become, as opposed to just throwing out 
yet another social post and hoping that it sticks when you're at the mercy of Zuckerberg and his cohort um, of whether they're even going to show it to anybody. You know, back in the day, I would do a post on Facebook or LinkedIn and people would see it. Now, unless you pay them, it's hard for them to even show it to people. So I know I'm ranting about this whole Facebook is evil thing, but I, I've just decided that, that there's a new way to do business. It's a kinder and gentler way of doing business. Business. And that there are definitely ways that we can all do that. And that it absolutely pays off in terms of the ways that we can grow our business. And I think it's super important. I mean, we'll dig in a little bit deeper around what that looks like, but it it's really was the heart of what grew social, wasn't it? It was people finding like-minded people around passion points and those yes. communities thrived. And to a certain degree, it has become much more commercial and the thinking has kind of lost that heart of why do people even want to be there and what's important to them? So I really want to kind of dig deeper. But before we do, you wrote Phenocracy with your daughter, uh, yeah. Rico, who I believe is a doctor. What was the merging of this medical background to what you were thinking and and how did you find that process? So, Rake, yeah, we did. Reiko and I wrote it together. She's now 27, but when we first started talking about this, she was around 21 or so years old. And so I would be asking her all kinds of questions. And, you know, she's also a massive fan, but she's a particular, in particular, a Harry Potter fan. She's read every book multiple times, seen every movie multiple times, gone to the wizard wizarding world of Harry Potter theme park in Orlando, Florida many times, and even even wrote an 85,000 word alternative ending to the Harry Potter series where Draco Malfoy is a spy for the Order of the Phoenix and put that on a fan fiction site that's been downloaded hundreds and sorry, been downloaded thousands of times, commented on hundreds of times. So Reiko totally gets this idea of fandom. She's a huge fangirl and we're utterly different, clearly different generations since I'm her father, different genders. Uh, my wife is Japanese, so Reiko, who was born in Tokyo, is mixed race. She is, as you said, a medical doctor. She's currently an emergency room resident at Boston Medical Center. So she comes at life from a scientific background. So she was a perfect person to become my co-author because we're so different, yet we have the same idea around fandom. So we decided to write the book together and research it together, which we did. And it worked out great because, you know, me coming at it from the perspective of a 50-something-year-old Caucasian man who loves the Grateful Dead and her coming at it from a mixed race millennial woman who loves Harry Potter, who also happens to be a neuroscientist and MD, meant that those two backgrounds were really, really great to make this book way better than I could have ever done it myself. And besides that, she's a better writer than me. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Plus, what a, what a beautiful collaboration. I mean, at its it heart, what, what do is. you think organizations need to do to build that kind of more inspired space that you're talking about, this creation of these fans and the phenocracy that you were talking about? So it really is a, tr a human approach to business. So the idea of fandom was fascinating because what we learned as we dug into it by speaking with some neuroscientists and interviewing hundreds of people about what they are a fan of and interviewing dozens and dozens of organizations, companies of all kinds that have built fans is that what it really comes down to is that we humans are all hardwired in us to want to be part of a tribe of life like-minded people. Because when we're a part of a tribe of like-minded people, that's when we feel safe and comfortable. That's when we feel as we needed and, 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 and at a place that we belong. So I, I mentioned I've been to 75 Grateful Dead concerts, love the band. I can be at a Grateful Dead concert. I can turn to anybody in the audience, never having met them and know that we have tons in common and, and immediately strike up a conversation. Same thing with Reiko in the world of Harry Potter. If you're at an event of a company that you do business with, a physical event back when those were happening pre-COVID, you could turn to anybody who has one of the badges on and have something in common with them. It's a tribe of like-minded people. One of your colleagues, Alan, um, who I've become online buddies with, and I share a weird fandom. We both love the Apollo Lunar Program, which is, I know, a really weird fandom, but I've got a collection of artifacts from the Apollo Lunar Program, and uh, I wrote a book called Marketing the Moon about the sales and marketing aspects of the Apollo Lunar Program. Had I not been a fan of the Apollo Lunar Program, and had Alan not be, I'm not sure that we would have gotten to know one another. Who knows? But mm. probably not. Here we are today because of that fandom. So what 
does that mean? We've found examples of organizations that have built fans of all kinds. One of my favorite examples is a company called Haggerty Insurance. They do automobile insurance, which is a category of product that practically everyone in the whole planet hates. <laughs> and they hate that insurance because nobody wants to buy auto insurance. It feels like you're just throwing your money away. And nobody ever wants to use the product because it meant you crashed your car. Yet here's Haggerty Insurance with over a million fans. How did they do it? They created a tribe of like-minded people. Haggerty does classic car auto insurance. So they go to over 100 classic car auto events around the, um, North America every year. They have a, a driver's club with 650,000 members where people can interact with other car lovers. You can find people who have the same model of classic car as you do and be part of that tribe of people. They have a YouTube channel with over a million followers. I mean, can you imagine an insurance company with a YouTube channel of over a million followers? And I spoke with Nick Haggerty, the entrepreneurial owner of Haggerty Insurance. He told me, David, we couldn't compete if we tried to be the low cost provider. We couldn't compete if we tried to spend more money in ads than anybody else, but become the catalyst for this fandom around classic cars, that we can do. We built our entire business on fans. And I'm a fan. I have a 1973 Land Rover Series 3. It's insured by Haggerty. I'm a fan of that business. So I believe, Reiko also believes that any organization, anyone listening into this, has an opportunity to build fans of your business. And it's really just about a more human approach and building a tribe of like-minded people. I'm curious because we've seen it ourselves. This feels like with COVID, there's almost more of an opportunity to go to those values and those common areas of inspiration and passion points because, and, and really values underpinning that because they're, it's made people reflect, right? What is important to them? So brands who unlock that, have you seen that actually be different or accelerated at this time of COVID? I have actually, yes, because, yeah. uh, because, during COVID, for the most part, we can't meet people in person. Yet each of us still has that strong desire for human connection. There's ways that we can make human connection and still build fans. So I'm going to mention two of them. The first one is kindness and generosity. In this era, we all have an opportunity to be kinder and gentler. And I'm going to give a specific example. It's actually a story that we wrote about in the book, Fanocracy, but an updated postscript since the book, and that's Duracell batteries. So Duracell has a program called Power Forward where they provide free batteries to people who are the victims of natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, things like that. And they have a fleet in North America of, of I think it's five or six vehicles, four-wheel drive, some of them, that go to areas of natural disaster and they give away free batteries. No obligation, you don't have to sign any forms, just like, here's your, what, what, what size do you need? Okay, for your flashlight, here's your batteries. And they've given away millions and millions of batteries to people in need when their power goes out. And so I spoke with Ramon Valentini, who's the VP of marketing for Duracell. And he goes, David, this is perfect for us because we're in the power business. You know, we power tools and radios and flashlights and other equipment that people need. And when the power goes out, our batteries are in even more demand. And he said, yes, we could sell these batteries for a lot more money during these natural disasters, but that's the time Time because that's the time they're most needed, but we would rather give them away and build fans now that people will buy our batteries for the rest of their lives. So I think that's really interesting. Now, what have they done during COVID? They realized that hospital workers and first responders are often short of batteries. They've given away, get this, 10 and a half million batteries in the last four months, 10 and a half million to first responders and healthcare workers. The other thing they've done is they recognized a very big need for power charging stations for mobile phones in hospital waiting rooms here in North America. Some of the hospitals have a lot of victims who have been brought into the emergency rooms and are brought uh, and, and are admitted to the hospital. What happens is their family members go with them and they often have temporary waiting areas where the family can wait in the hospital for word about their loved one. But what happens in the hospital, um, 
waiting room is the family members there with their mobile phone texting friends and relatives and checking the news and checking their emails and whatnot. And their mobile phone battery drains and they need to charge it, but they can't. And now they're without power. So that's why Duracell has given away thousands of power charging stations to hospital waiting rooms. I mean, who would have imagined that that was a problem? Power stations in, in hospital waiting rooms, but it was and is. And no, they don't sell them. They don't gouge the hospitals and say, now that you need it, you have to pay for it. They give it away for free. And Ramon Valentini told us that people absolutely remember this. They remember it they then will be our fans and do business with us for the rest of their life. Mm. Um, and that's super cool. So the second thing is video. We have an opportunity during all of us, any one of us listening in on this, I use it myself, have an opportunity to use video during this time and basically casual, look into the camera and provide information to people. Video on your website, a YouTube channel. If you don't already have one, now's a good time to start one. Or just uploading video onto social networks like LinkedIn, for example. You, you heard my rant earlier, if you were listening into the early part of this podcast, about the social networks and the way their algorithms are tuned. But one thing I've noticed is the algorithms are also tuned to show video more frequently to people than they show than it shows text-based content. Mm -hmm. So a good way to, to outsmart the algorithms is to create a great piece of video content, stick them up on LinkedIn, let's say, or Facebook, and often those will get more views than a text-based post that's that's similar. And so that's a great way to get that content out there. So those are two ways that I've seen during COVID that organizations could build fans. One, be kind and gentle and generous and give more than you have to during this time like Duracell. And number two, when you can't meet people in person, you can virtually meet them using video. I mean, both those examples you gave, the insurance company and, I mean, particularly Duracell, that's a very giving, giving back to their customers. But it's really this respect to the customer at the heart. It's actually understanding them and what they care about and genuinely adding value. Where does measuring what matters to the customer, measuring the success or those opportunities or your investment, like how do you kind of look at that? Because organisations want to know whether what they're doing is working or even where to kind of invest their marketing dollars in the first place instance. What have you seen work? What do you think it needs to be about? Where does it matter? What would you say to our listeners? That's a big question. And obviously, you are an organization that have done a, a lot of work in this area. But what I've seen, I like to come at this question in terms of problems that I see a lot of organizations falling into the trap of. So first of all, early part of your question is what should they be looking at and how can they reach people? I think the biggest mistake that organizations make is that they focus on talking about their product and services way too much and not enough about understanding the needs of the people that they serve, the people that they're trying to reach. That's a very first step, the fundamental first step. You're not going to be as successful if you're simply talking about yourself, your products and services, instead of thinking, who are these people I'm trying to reach and what's important to them? So that's a, a very early first step. When it comes to measurement, one of the things that I've seen so frequently is that so many organizations choose to measure the first touch and the last touch and don't think about what's going on in the middle. So here's what I mean by that. So many marketers think the first time a customer interacts with my organization, that's what I need to measure. So the first time they download an ebook, the first time they sign up for my email newsletter, the first time they do something in my click funnel or whatever it is that I've built, that's super important. And so they often, marketers will attribute a sale, you know, a dollar value to the first time that an organization is engaged with that company. But that's, a, in my mind, a hugely false metric because it does not measure the times that you didn't track that person, like when they were following something that they hadn't yet filled out a form so you know who they are. The other metric that some organizations use is the last touch. What was the last thing they did before they started to pay us money? You know, what was the video they watched that got them over the top? And, and that's also, I believe, a false metric. What I think is more important is how can you look at all of the touch points and figure out where are people engaging and how are they engaging 
And what are the things that are important that maybe you haven't been measuring? And I'll give you a specific example. I've been on the advisory board of HubSpot since the very beginning of the company. When I joined their advisory board, they, have no, they had no clients, beta software only, and eight employees. Last week, they announced their most recent earnings. They're estimating over $800 million in annual revenue this year. They have over 3,000 employees, they have 82,000 customers, and they have a $10 billion market capitalization on the New York Stock Exchange, a huge success story. And I've been on the advisory board since the very beginning and have worked very closely with HubSpot for 13 years. One of the things that they told me about what they measure is they said, David, we measure everything and it's really, really important to understand where are those bits of data that are in the middle of the funnel that people are looking at that are really important. And they gave me an example that was surprising to me, but very illustrative. And that is they learned that 20% of their new customers viewed at some point in the sales process, the CEO's bio page. Nobody would think as a marketer, oh, I have to work really hard on the CEO's bio page because that's gonna influence 20% of my new business. And if you, if you didn't measure it, you wouldn't know that. And if you're only focused on when was the first time somebody filled out a form, you wouldn't notice it. If you're only focused on what did they do just before they bought my product, you would never notice it. There's often blog posts that people will find and read in the sales process that won't appear on the typical measurements. So how can you measure what's going on during the whole buyer journey? I think that's a really important aspect of measurement. I think it's a good point. And I, I mean, that plays to that whole kind of digital marketing funnel, right? From brand consideration, conversion, and then nurture, what else matters to them? We know in business, we did a LinkedIn study. It's it's at least 14 touches of content before a sale and 75, 80% predetermined before they talk to them. And the latest Google research they did over two years, it can be up to 80 touch points, right? So you need to measure a lot, not just first and last. There's a lot of touch right. points in the middle. And obviously not all customers are going to take the same journey. So if no, they see, no, see this not, now, no. what do they want next? You know, like it's that's that journey ex- that's design. Exactly I, right. I, like, I like that you emphasize that journey, the pathway that helps someone know that you genuinely know them. And then I also want to mention one more thing. I think that too many organizations, because they want to measure and because they want to generate sales leads, put a gate in front of too much content. I'm a big believer in make it free. Don't require people to register. So what typically happens, this is particularly with business to business, B2B, but it does happen in consumer as well. What people will do is they say, spend a whole bunch of time creating a wonderful ebook or white paper or something and then immediately slap a gate on it and say you can't have this content until you give me your email address and contact information first well that's like going into a bar and meeting someone and say i can't talk to you unless you give me your business card first sorry i can't talk to you insert your phone number onto my phone before i talk to you (laughs) that's right that's exactly right um and and so i think that what you need to do is think, how can I give a whole bunch of stuff away and have the knowledge that my content is so good that people will want to do business with me rather than try to coerce them into number one, filling out a form and number two, then hassling them with emails and phone calls to try to get them to go to the next step. Rather create fans of what you do. And this is exactly what HubSpot does. They create fans, people who love their content, who love their events, who love the, the, the free content that they produce, who love their HubSpot Academy courses, which are all free. They love all that stuff. And eventually some of them become customers, but it's not all about trying to wrestle you to the ground every step of the way in your sales process. And David, can I ask just for those that might think only big companies can do it like a HubSpot, that that's kind of the the purpose of aligns to their business. Have you seen other businesses take that view and do it well, maybe smaller in size or at startup or, you know, when does this matter most? Like I I said, I've been working with HubSpot since they had zero customers and eight employees. 
Sure. They've built to be a $10 billion company exclusively by doing this. Mm. We've been working together. I'm not going to take the credit. They did the work, but we've been working together for 13 years. I've seen the success. It's been a phenomenal thing to watch and, and to contribute to and be a part of. But yes, any organization, big or small, can achieve success using these strategies. I mean, I, would, I already mentioned Haggerty Insurance, but mm. same deal with them. Small insurance company became the largest classic car auto insurance company on the planet by using these ideas. So it doesn't really matter, big or small, B2B or consumer or nonprofit or even government agency, it doesn't matter. These ideas absolutely work. So David, if I ask if we had to give the advice to someone listening, what's the one thing they can do to start creating this change in their organization so they become the champions of the customer and building these fans and these journeys that they're going to, to love? How do they, what's the first step? What should they do? Like make them your kind of, you know, the army of believers. What should they do? Well, the first thing is to really give thought to how you're presenting yourself to the world on a basic level. And if you're only focused on your products and services and you're not understanding the needs of your buyers, your potential customers, then you need to sort of rethink how you're approaching the way that you're doing your marketing. And I have a couple of little, I don't want to call them tests, that makes it sound too formal, but a couple of little things you can do. Take a look at your website and just get Get a sense of are you talking to your potential customers or, or are you just essentially talking about yourself? How often do you use the word we versus how often do you use the word you is a good little test, a little simple test. Another simple test is take a look at your website, then find your biggest competitor's website, substitute your competitor's name for your name on your website. If it still makes sense, you're not really focused on putting yourself out there in an interesting way. And I think that this idea of building fans, this idea of creating a tribe really comes from understanding the people you're trying to reach really deeply. It's very difficult to build a tribe and to build fans if you're only talking about yourself. Oh, that's amazing. Where, where can listeners find out more about your latest book, Fanocracy? Fanocracy.com, www.fanocracy.com. We've got a cool website there where you can watch your videos and some infographics you can download and other stuff there. Learn a little bit about me, learn a little bit about my daughter, Reiko. So that's the first place I would go. I tweet at DM Scott. That's D-M-S-C-O-T-T. -T. If you want to know a little bit more about me, it's David Meerman Scott, a small SEO tip. If your name is David Scott and it's extremely common and there's a David Scott who walked on the moon and a David Scott who's an Ironman triathlon champion and a David Scott who's a member of the U.S. Congress from the state of Georgia and many, many other David Scotts, it's very hard to get found in the search engines. But if you begin using your middle name, like I did, David Meerman Scott, which I did 20 years ago, and you become the only David Meerman Scott in the entire world, this is a good thing. So one of the best moves I ever made in my whole business career was a real simple move. That is 20 years ago, I started using my middle name professionally, David Meerman Scott. So if you want to learn more about me, just Google my full name, David Meerman Scott. That's fantastic. I've got some rapid fire questions we ask our yeah. guests if you're happy to have a go at them. So what's your guilty I'm pleasure? <laughs> my guilty pleasure books. Uh, I never feel guilty when I buy a book. I love it. I, I think I share that with you as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pick a brand or brands that inspire you and why? Grain Surfboards is a wooden surfboard manufacturer in York, Maine, in the northeast of the United States. They do wooden surfboards using a boat building technique, and they're absolutely fabulous. Um, you asked a, an earlier question about how can smaller brands build fans. Grain Surfboards is, I think there's three people or four people in the company, and they have a huge number of fans, me included. I've got two Grain Surfboards. Actually, just how often do you surf? I live in the Northeast. It's cold where I live. So um, if I'm at my home, and I have a beach house, so only about six months out of the year do I surf at my beach house. And then when I have an opportunity to travel somewhere, I'll try to get in the water as well. So maybe 50 days a year. 
five zero okay. days a year. Well, when you come to Sydney, we've got to take you to the northern beaches. at surfing heaven. Um, I've surfed here, manly. So. I've surfed manly uh, maybe forty or fifty times. Bondi a few times. I'm not very good. Sometimes I see the waves at a place like Bondi, and I'm like, forget it. I'm not going in today. <laughs> Love it. All right. And if you could pick an age that you could stay for the rest of your life, what age would that be and why? What a tough question. I would go with right now. Oh, I'm okay. having a good, I'm having a good time right now. All good. Sounds great. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. I feel pleasure, like Emma. it was music to me. It was you know, preaching certainly to me as the converter, but it's that care of your customer. Like the more you can know about them, be where they are, genuinely deliver value. I loved your tests, those quick tests that you gave because that, that really does hold people accountable. I encourage people to read your latest book and all your books. Alan has certainly been a fan and kept me abreast and I've heard him quote actually some of the things that you've said today. So it's Thank been an absolute much. joy to talk to you today on Masters of Metrics. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Eh? Thank you. This podcast is hosted by Digivisor and I'm Emma LaRusso. Bye for now.